Hello, everyone. And for those of you who celebrated, I hope you all had a very happy Thanksgiving. I'm Dr. Louise Bertini, the Executive Director of RC, and I want to welcome you all to our November public lecture uh, with, and today we're very happy to have the iconic Aza Fahmi and Omnea Abdelbar, uh, who are speaking to us uh, about their lecture title, Mamluks Made Modern, When Design Meets History. And we're particularly excited to bring you this special lecture that will discuss this collaboration on the collection in giving Mamluk architecture a new dimension and how it reconnects the public to this rich and unique cultural heritage. For those of you who are new to RC, we are a private nonprofit organization whose mission is to support research on all aspects of Egyptian history, culture, foster a broader knowledge about Egypt among the general public, and support American Egyptian cultural ties. As a nonprofit, we rely on RC members to support our work. So I want to first give a very special welcome to our RC members who are joining us today. If you're not already a member and are interested in joining, I invite you to visit our website, rc.org, to join online and learn more. We provide a suite of benefits to our members, including our private member-only lecture series, and our next member-only lecture will be on December 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern time with Dr. Caroline Ramsey of Carleton University and is titled Coptic Feminism, Orthodox Songs and Gender Reformation in the North American Diaspora. And starting on December 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, we are going to have the first of a four-part public lecture series titled Africa Interconnected, Ancient Egypt in Nubia. This first lecture in this series is titled From Slave to Demon, Baria in the Ethiopian Prayer Schools by Dr. Solange Aspie. For more on this lecture series, you can visit our website, rc.org. So with that, I'm now going to turn it over to the reason why you are all here today. And I am beyond honored to introduce you to Aza Fahmi and Omnea Abdelbar. Aza Fahmi is a researcher, author, and jewelry designer. She is chairwoman and creative director at Aza Fahmi Jewelry. She graduated from the Faculty of Fine Arts, where she studied interior design and then started her career at the State Information Service. Simultaneously, she initiated her apprenticeship in jewelry, training with the master craftsman of Khan Khalili. Later, she pursued her studies in jewelry making and design at London Polytechnic. Throughout her long career spanning over 50 years, she has extensively traveled in Egypt and abroad to better understand and research traditional jewelry and cultural heritage. Today, Aza Fahmi is considered one of the top jewelry designers in the MENA region and has taken the role of translating Egyptians culture, heritage and art to the world through contemporary jewelry design that reflects both her intense research approach and craftsmanship preservation. She created the first Egyptian multinational brand in jewelry and in partnership with her daughters Fatma Ghali as managing director and Amina Ghali as head designer. In 2015, she independently funded and established the design studio by Aza Fahmi, the first education hub of its kind in the region. And last year, she launched vocational training in jewelry making with funding from Drosos to train 200 young apprentices to ensure sustainability of the craftsmanship in Egypt. And she is author of Enchanted Jewelry in Egypt and the Traditional Jewelry of Egypt. And Omnea Abdelbar is an architect and art historian specialized in Islamic art and architecture. She has experience in urban conservation, monument restoration, and cultural heritage documentation and digitization, and holds a PhD in history from I Marseille University. Omnea is currently the Barakat Trust Fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and leading the digitization project on the KAC Cresswell photographic collections in partnership with the American University in Cairo, the Ashmolean Museum and Harvard University. In Cairo, she is working with the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Foundation on projects dedicated to rescue Cairo's Mamluk cultural, uh, architectural heritage and the preservation of traditional craftsmanship. So with that, I now turn it over to Aza and Omnea. Thank you, 
Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you very much, Louisa, for this introduction. Yes. Uh, it's actually, uh, first, both Az and I would love to um, thank you for inviting us to share this love for the, the Mamluk collections that we worked on together. And it's really a subject that is very, very dear to both our hearts. And I don't know if anyone can tell uh, from uh, the first uh, 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 image in, uh, in the presentation, if you can tell where is photograph actually, uh, send us some notes. I'd love to hear if you can uh, grasp where it is. Um, because it's very exciting. I mean, I picked it randomly like this because it, it just shows uh, lots of patterns, but it's, it's just an image that I took. This is not a collage. Um, I'd like to start by uh, uh, speaking with my earliest memory of Aza's work, because this is, talk will, pro, will be, as you will see, uh, uh, quite a conversation between both of us, um, which uh, at the end will show you how it led to a fantastic collaboration with Aza and her amazing team uh, in Cairo. My earliest uh, memory of Aza's work is actually with um, uh, the Nubia collection she uh, she created. I'm just trying to see. <clears throat> yeah, here we go. Uh, this is when I was trying to remember the earliest memory of I have of your work, Aza. These uh, popped out in my in my mind, and I remember uh, seeing them uh, maybe in the early '90s. And uh, it was it was something completely different because because I was um, fascinated with architecture, and I saw that you already uh, you know you're putting a bit of architecture into jewelry. So for me this was quite uh, quite interesting. But when we talked, you told me that there was already a long 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 road before these uh, little pieces from Nubia. Yes, because uh, when we st when I'm starting doing jewelry, first of all I was interesting. Uh, in the Islamic architecture. And then I went to the museum and start looking to the jewelry in the Islamic museum. And I think I the first copy, which I in the beginning I was copying, I copied one of the Ayyubid uh, necklaces. Uh, and I look at the, uh, you know, the googlet, uh, the filter of the googlet, the Fatimid one. Uh, yes, we found this, we yes. found this earring that you made yes, early collection. on. Yes, very famous collection in the Islamic Museum. So I did a collection of pendants and uh, and earring. It was a very simple, but it was different, and people love it. And then I went to literature uh, like Salah Jaheen and uh, poetry and things like that. Uh, and then, and then this led you up to it, yes. Yes, the architecture. I was fascinating about Hassan Fatmi, the present architecture in Egypt. And uh, no, this is late collection. When I did Hassan Fatmi collection with the AOC, uh, his uh, ar archive in the AOC. But before that, it was the Houses of the Nile, the, the big primitive one. This one is more sophisticated uh, at, the, at the left is you, you find a, a big piece of turquoise, which I bought it from Himalayan. It was a, a rare pieces of turquoise. And I did a complete village uh, on the, on the, on the a sculpture, on the, on the, on the uh, earring. Uh, but this is why I thought before we embark on the Mamluks, I wanted to give our audience and um, our guests today a bit of feeling of uh, the kind of jewelry you've worked on because the Nubia were my earliest memories, but the Pharaonic collection, it was something quite outstanding and, and, and glamorous when you did it. And yes. I remember you told me that this was, this was a challenge. This was eight was years of work. Yes, if, if, if you look at these people and you find what they did in everything, in statues, in, in the, uh, on, the, on the temples, how you can, how you can, you can, came yeah, near to them or, uh, and I don't like copies. I don't like to do copies uh, uh, because copies is everywhere in the museum. I want to do something new. So actually it took me about eight years, which is I, I was hesitating what I do with these people. These people, they are great. And they have to do something which is uh, relevant to them, have the spirit of the pharaohs, 
but different from what what's what's in the in the museums. And because in, uh, in, in this piece, you told me there is lots of symbolism in it. Yes, this because uh, I studied uh, I studied the, because each piece, you know, the eye or the anchor, the everything has a has a meaning. But I I put all this in one in one symbol. And you know, we always sell our jewelry. And then with, of course. With, with, with explanation, what's that? Uh, this is Nehbet, which is, uh, you know, yes, the, the necklace, yes. But, and, and I insist of call it Nehbet uh, because I, 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 I wanted to, to, the people to say it that the Veronic way. Nehbet is uh, the, 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 um, the, the, mother pro protect, the mother protection or the Al Umm Al Hamia. What's Al Umm Al Hamia? The protective, the protective, the protective mother. The protective yeah. mother. But I, actually, it's different because I, all I, this, I, it's, it is from the clothes of the, of the priests. It's not for some of them, they are in the, in the wings and the others are, I took it from the, the, the clothes of the priests. And I personally, my favorite ever is this one. Because I think the, the the amazing thing is the fact that you managed to make this piece wearable. It's from the Tutankhamun uh, uh, yes. objects. Yes, yes. yes. The and I think th this is when you can tell that the designer is a good designer because you managed to to uh, pick an old piece and make it uh, wearable today in our contemporary context. That's and on me, I, I use many techniques. You know, we, we, we of course we make it like a sculpture. And we know the filigree, the, the pharaohs, they never use filigree. I love filigree. It's, this is an Islamic technique, which is already very rare now. But I, I put some filigree work in, in the wings, which I, I, I like it very much. Lovely. But then not just the focus is not always on Egypt. You also went and, and discovered other cultures. And maybe the Africa collection was one of the um, the, the exciting ones you worked on. Yes, because and you, you know, told me that it's here. It's not it's, the architecture here. It's even intangible heritage. Yes, you know, before because I started with Egypt and I went to Syria, then Iraq and then Yemen and then North Africa. And then I found, you know, the, the whole world is in front of me. Why I, I, I am here in this area, if I start looking I love Africa, because part of me is African. My grandmother is a Sudanese. Um, actually, I went to Uganda, I went to Ethiopia, uh, and I have a big collection of books about African art. And, uh, you know, I choose the body painting to inspire me for, uh, for, this, uh, for this earring. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And then the poetry. Very uh -huh. quickly, tell us about your relationship with the, with the word and the calligraphy that you're using in your jewelry, and how do you pick it? You know, I read very, you know, I, 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 I mean, every day I have to read something, either philosophy or uh, literature or things. But I, I want people to share, I share people with, with what I'm reading and what I like. But this is, was the Gobran Khalil Gobran collection. Uh, it was very successful. It is from the book of uh, the Prophet. It's one the, the famous book of Gubran Khalil Gubran. Uh, we did a beautiful collection. I think uh, this is, was uh, uh, 2000 or before 2000. 2000 yes. Very, yes, it was very successful. Uh, and we did Ibn Hazm. You know, the, the Mutafawwaf, yes, Ibn Hazm the, from the Andalusia. Uh, from his book as well and this and is I'm ending with this one also one of my uh, my biggest fans your tahaya for tahaya yes yes i love this i love this woman i respect this woman on on in all of the levels but i want i and i love because she's always dancing with this peasant uh, pieces but actually we we did a modern version of uh, peasant uh, pieces and I dedicated this collection to her. That wonderful, yes. So I want to take a few steps back and uh, also um, tell our uh, audience today a bit about your training and your practice and what 
took you to Khan al-Khalili early on and how did you start? You know, actually I, I graduated from faculty of, uh, of fine art, but, and I worked in the government for a long time, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the same time, I didn't feel that this is for me. This is not for me. And I start looking and, um, you know, I found a book. It was the first international book fair in, uh, in Cairo. And, uh, uh, you know, I was taking very little money in, in that time. Actually, when I saw the German book, I bought it with all the money. But I was sure that this book is going to change my life. And it did. You know, and it took uh, you to Khan Khalili afterwards. Yes, it took me to Khan Khalili because I don't want, because first I went to Faculty of uh, Applied Art and I don't want to spend four years and I wanted to make it a short way. Uh, all the short way is go and work with uh, an atelier or things like that in Khan Khalili. And uh, I practiced for two years at the same time as I was working in the government. I finished my work at two in the government, go to Khan Khalili, reach Khan Khalili at three and work in Khan Khalili from three or four till nine. And then go home. I was working, I was living in Helwan at that time. I reached my home at 10 or 11 every day. Uh, but it was a good experience because uh, in that time, uh, it was in the late 60s, beginning of 70s, all the big masters in Khan Khalili was there, and there is rules for, for the craftspeople. So I know all the, the, the area and all the people, all the top people. And in that time, I took, I took notes about who's doing who and what's the techniques for this and this and this. And it's helped me to build my first book. Totally. But then you also told me that whenever you had a break, you used to go for a walk in the historic city. So it's, it's interesting yes. because you actually started with the Mamluks, Yaza, you know, you were looking yes. from the window and you would see the, the, the dome of uh, the complex of Sultan Kalawan. That's and right. The, the, first man, the first man which I worked to, 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 to teach me, he, he put me beside the window. And when I, when I look from the window, I found the complex of, uh, of Sultan Kalawan. And for the first time, I was fascinating about using calligraphy on top, uh, under the dome of the, of, uh, of the Oppa. Uh, and I said to myself, if they are using calligraphy in, in architecture, why I can use it in the jewelry? And, and this idea started from, from there. After that, you know, I, I think I saw, uh, I, I, yes, I, I did this, I did this, uh, one of the early, uh, one of the early, Braces, which I did a long time ago, you know. Yeah, this is yeah exactly. And for me personally, I, I'm I'm loving that you, um, uh, currently you are uh, revisiting the old designs. And today, you also you have this one was launched very recently in the in the latest yes. collection. So yeah. it's again, it's I mean I love the fact that you also check back and it's it's not a problem to revisit old design and to perfect perfect oh, actually, it differently and to add, I, add layers I, to it. Yes, and and this actually this is Amina's my daughter's uh, design because uh, you know she she took from the old and make something which is more elaborate. Uh, this is Amina's work. Uh, and then I think it was after that we we have to make a logo for we have to make a logo for the company and I always fascinating about about the the, the emblem of the of the sultans the rank the rank, What's the rank? Yes. the rank in in, in in English and I uh, yes and I I said to myself we have to do something which is related to this shape the shape is fantastic. Uh, I think after that, it was the program of, uh, of Gamal al-Ghitani, the, the great Gamal al-Ghitani, which he did a, a, a series in the, in the TV about the Mamluk. It was, uh, uh, I Galiyat think, al 30, yes. 30, yes, 30 pieces, which, you know, for the first time I saw Mamluk streets, monuments, mosques, houses, and he described uh, widely about what's the meaning of all this. But when you collect all together, and then I met you, you remember? 
Then I met exactly, you. Exactly, Matt. This was all in your reservoir, and and we met in London in in May 2017. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, I yes. mean, I was just invited to a reception at the residence of the Egyptian ambassador, and here uh, you yes, were presenting and, uh, a publication the, on the Daughters of the Nile. Daughter of the Nile, yes. yes. And uh, I remember then, Azaf, I don't know if you remember, because I just submitted my application for the Mamluk Mimbar project at the time, and I was waiting to see if our projects would be successful or not. And I was telling you, you asked me, what are you doing in London? And I started telling you what I'm doing. And I don't know what came into me. I looked at you and told you, don't you want to design a piece for the Mamluk members of Cairo? <laughs> then you said, okay, let's think about it. Then it's end up by, by a collection, not only one piece. I, I, I saw Exactly, because you came day. back the following day. Yes, I met, exactly. I met you in, that, and that's why in Albert, yes, I remember. And we, we went to the Victoria and Albert Museum, and at the museum we have 14 sketchbook from this British architect, James Wilde, who yeah. came to Cairo in the 1840s. And at the time, Cairo was actually in a, in a very particular time in history in the 19th century. It was before all the expansions and the development that would take place under Khedewi Ismail. So the city was a bit frozen in time, but the city was also terribly neglected. And I think James Wilde being the architect he was, sketching these um, items and details as you see on the screen here. I think it was his way of saying, I need to preserve these beautiful, uh, this beautiful work for the generations to come. And actually when some, some of the pieces that he has checked are no longer existing. But for me personally, when I see these designs, because when we walk in the street and we look at the facades of the architecture, that is something, it's another dimension. But when you start looking at it in, the, in, in the, 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 the dimension of a paper, you know, and of a drawing, this is when you feel a design can start uh, building up. And then we went to Cairo and we took the entire team, uh, even with the marketing, not just the design uh, team, but also the marketing team to visit the historic city. And uh, I was privileged because I picked the, the locations and I took you to all the places I liked. So here we are in front of the, um, the member of Sultan Qaid Bey. And uh, in the other one, actually, I don't remember where the it other was one was. Um, I, I think, in, I think this is Sheikh, why. Maybe probably. It, yeah, it, is, it was probably in Wyatt Sheikh. Yeah. And I think the, the fact that also the team has seen these uh, monuments that close, it has helped them uh, visualize what was coming after. Um, and now, you know, you know, now they, they memorize each motif. And they know by heart, this is almost Sultan Shaban. This is Mardini. This is which I love it because they never, they never, they, uh -huh. they, I'm, I'm also. Yes, it was yeah, really. Totally. Uh, yeah, yeah. For the, the, the discussions da, da, da. in front of the members, exactly. And the, and the craftsmanship, because here in particular, you told me that the, the, the carving and the inlay and the details of the geometry, it has, it has been. Um, yes. quite a sure, revealing yes. of the level of craftsmanship they had during this Mamluk period. Yes, and this minute design, how they put ivory and uh, mother of pearl and silver in this perfectly, perfectly. You know, we did the, we did an, uh, an earring of uh, Bas Bay. Yeah, and we'll show it that way. Very quickly, I would like to just answer these two questions. Why the Mamluks? Why not? Because, I mean, we're in Egypt, so why is the Mamluk period that we have focused on working on? And for me particularly, why did I take you to see all these beautiful members? Um, so the Mamluk Sultanate started in Egypt in 2050, and it lasted in 1517 when the Ottoman act, uh, came uh, to Cairo. But the, the Mamluks were not only in Cairo, bigger city like Damascus, Aleppo, Jerusalem, and the two holy cities of Medina and Mecca were, uh, were under uh, the Mamluk uh, Sultanate at the time. And therefore, Cairo was the capital, and Cairo started getting this imperial dimension, which uh, I believe was lost since the time of ancient Egyptians, because before that we had Baghdad, we had Damascus, you know, with the Abbasid and the Umayyads. And then with the Mamluk, it start 
getting this new uh, volume. And since the money was there, because as well, I mean, economically, it was doing well. So all the artisan and artists, they came, it was like a magnet, Yaza, you know, they came because this is where the projects were. The sultans were embarking on fascinating, on very exciting patronage in the city, uh, building uh, beautiful complexes, because architecture was also a tool to uh, spread the message that this is a power of empire and this is a solid empire. And therefore, you read in the Mamluk sources, and, and, and it tells you of people coming from Tabriz, from Damascus, even uh, from, uh, from Turkey, to work in Egypt. And the Mamluks, as you know, they built these beautiful complexes, Sultan Hassan, which is considered like the fourth pyramid in Egypt, and then the complexes of Kalawun and Nasser Muhammad, and uh, El Ghuri, and uh, the, the two minarets on Babzuela. These are Mamluk minarets. Babzuela was built uh, before that, actually, uh, during uh, the Fatimid period. But here I wanted to give a closer look on some details in the design. Like, it is not just one um, material, you know. They perfected the work on metal, on wood, on marble, on carving on stone. It feels like no material was invincible for them. Just whatever it is, they, they are capable of perfecting it and formulating their ideas. It's like a canvas that they would draw uh, their, uh, their patterns on. And so this is just to show you, I mean, these are really zoom ins on uh, uh, the Mamluk details that you can find when you go visit their monuments in Cairo. And don't, but don't also something that I wanted actually uh, sorry, Omne, I want yeah, to ask. Here, here I have a question for you, Yaz. Okay. Naam, fadal. Uh, no, I no, want. Because... I want to say something. This is uh, uh, crafts and uh, and civilization. I flourish uh, with the money and uh, uh, you know of, of richness and eco a good economic uh, situation. Totally, uh, but. But here is a designer, Yang, this is a question for you because you are a designer and your eye is now experienced and trained. Why do you think there was the, such strength in the Mamluk design? Uh, you know, I think, I think that the very special designs in the Mamluk, I found it in the geometric pattern, which is uh, completely, uh, completely new and uh, you know, and in that time, a lot of people came, like, what did you say, from all over the, uh, the from around the, the good crafts people from Persia, from uh, from Damascus, from the, and uh, invented this strong uh, geometry uh, design. It was something new. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and modern at the same time. Yeah, and when you look to the to the left, to the right one, it's completely modern, completely modern. But at the same time, it is traditional. It's the it's these hidden lines that are the the invisible lines of the designer that allows you to have the the end result at the end. Geometry is usually not the thing that you see because it's like the construction lines that you work around. And I've learned that you know. One thing uh, that the lockdown forced me to do in a way is that I took on my compass and I started drawing the geometry from, from the members because I wanted as well to understand the construction and the, um, the composition of the geometry itself. And it took me a long time actually to, to understand um, how these um, patterns were created. But I'm very grateful, you know, because it, it's it's also the repetition. You have to go, you, you try yeah. once and it, it goes wrong and you try again and you, you learn from it. And I'm Magic. showing this because this is a, on Magic. the right, it's my drawing. On the left, this is a, a friend that I met on social media, Margie. I've drawn my pattern. You will see it's the same pattern. Mine is from Cairo, from the Khanka of Bars Bay, uh, which has this uh, member. Uh, that we just showed you and margie i think she she draw she, she did her drawing based on uh, a monument in iran so in a way the geometry is is like a universal language that is used by um the designers of um it's true the area and, and the designers of today and i'm very happy that the geometry is becoming more and more into light lately and i'm seeing many artists are using it uh, in their own work and and, and i believe it will create um also a big, um, uh, a big wave of beautiful, uh, 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 beautiful work. Um, this is just to show you. That's that's another thing. But very, very quickly now, if you go to any museum with Islamic collections around the world, 
the Mamluk artifacts and the Mamluk objects are always in uh, the prime location. The mosque lamps are um, a beauty to be seen. This is at the British Museum. Uh, the the metal work, you know, even though the metal was in, the work was famous from Mosul in Iraq, but the Mamluks perfected it uh, in a way, uh, and uh, you you find the pieces on sale sometimes at the auctions, and they always uh, hit uh, the highest uh, price. And the Quran, you know, the illumination of the Quran. And here's when you see perhaps perhaps with the Quran, this is when I feel. The, uh, more, most the designer because it's uh, on, on paper and that's the medium I'm used to to use. But again, and, and this one is from Beba Salja Shankir's uh, um, Quran, which is at the, the British Library here in London. Uh, I've put these two, they are at the Museum of the Victoria and Albert, but these are copies, you know. In the 19th century, the museum sent uh, uh, staff to go and do casts from the monuments in Egypt. And, very quickly the, uh, to tell you just for the background so the vna was created in the mid 19th century to teach people good design basically if we put it yeah. in, a, in, a, in a very short sentence and uh, and they saw that these designs are something that could be an inspiration to the british designers here in uh, in london and in in britain in in general and so if you go to the museum you will find them in the cast courts uh one is from sultan hassan and the other one is from uh sultan Kaid bay and then my second question, when I told you why the members. So the members are these stepped uh, pulpits that you find to the right of the mihrab. And this is where the imam stands to give the Friday uh, sermons and the Eid sermons uh, as well. But what happened is in the past uh, years, they have been a constant target for looting. And I started documenting looting in 2012, especially after the uprising in 2011 and with the security void that was created. And I realized that um, I have even this, you know, I can show you from 2006, 2019, we had 25 monuments hit. 2011, 2017, we had 15. And even in one month in June, 2014, we had seven monuments. So it, it, it was very obvious to me that, you know, probably because there is an art market, there is a buyer. So people were stealing these pieces, but the pieces would appear later on on the art market, but I couldn't link them to their original uh, location. And this is why the idea of creating a documentation project for the, uh, the Mamluk members, which afterwards we uh, added restoration and the conservation as well uh, was put in place. Just very briefly, just to show you, we had 14 members that were attacked. And this is the member of Merdani, which was entirely all the, the 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 pieces were stripped out from the member in 2008 if i'm not confusing yeah 2007 and just recently but this was uh, on the market here in london last october and this panel is actually from the member of maridani but it was an old uh, uh, theft because it was the member was also looted in the 19th century. But just to show that there is a demand and people are appreciating this art and are buying it. And, uh, and just a tiny, tiny piece like this can fetch up to 5,000 British pounds. So it is uh, a big uh, budget. Um, and that's why we, we, we started our project, which uh, we've been working on for two years. We're almost done with it. And we managed, alhamdulillah, to document 45 members, and we've rescued more than 20 members in, in, uh, in Cairo. So I'm very, very proud of this project and the team of the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Foundation. But then, you know, just to give the, our, uh, our speakers this, uh, this uh, bit of background, and in, in a way, so I was focusing on my members, and you were trying to uh, find uh, what can be done with all these Mamluk uh, architecture. This is when I, I remember we went for very focused trips afterwards uh, to check um, some uh, some monuments that I, I I particularly love so much. The Mausoleum of Kalaun is is a masterpiece. The dome and uh, the work that was done is something. Sometimes some historians even call it. It's like uh, the the Jerusalem of uh, of Cairo. You know, like the, some people think it was inspired from the Dome of the Rock even, but I'm not, uh, I'm not very sure about it. But it's an iconic uh, architectural uh, foundation in, uh, in the heart of, uh, of our, our historic city. And um, I, want, yeah, I wanted you to talk about, about this piece because you saw this in the, in the Mausoleum of Kalawun, Aza. And it's yes. just, it's a, it's a marble panel, not as big as this. It's it's yeah. it's a with a very one. interesting design. 
Yeah, it's it's a, it's a small design, and the amount of work and colors uh, in this small piece. The minute I saw that this small part, I saw it as a as a bracelet, and uh, you know, and I don't want it to do it flat. I want to do it on levels like sculpture. So it took a lot of time to 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 give it uh, levels. So it is about this uh, this design on the on the right time. It is three level of of silver and gold. Uh, I inlaid um, lapis lazuli, and we did a lot of uh, tries, cartoons, and paper and things to be fit on the on the hand. And the system, you open it and you and you you, you close it. Uh, it took us a long time to to be easy to to wear. And it, and in a way, this is the role of the designer because you saw a two dimensional uh, pattern. And you yeah. managed to transform it into a three-dimensional piece. Yeah. And that, this transformation is actually not easy at all. You, you know, Leia, it gives another feeling when you see things alive in front of you with levels of, of metal and levels of silver and gold. It, it gives another impression in the design. Uh, and, you know, I dedicated this to Gamal al Ghitani, and I put one of his... Uh, um, uh, writing on the back of the uh, in the inside in the inside in the, of the cup. It was a Sufi I, man. Yeah, yeah. Actually, in in I would love to research this pattern were a bit more in depth because I'm trying to see where it all originated. If you remember our very very first slide, this pattern was in it, but it was not in Kalawan. It is actually in the mausoleum of a, um, an, a Mamluk emir called Salar, uh, who was actually from the same time as well in the 14th century. And, uh, and we see this pattern re re repeated, repeatedly in a, few, in a number of monuments as well. I'm trying, you know, it's like a detective. You're trying to understand what was happening. Was it a craftsman who was famous and so he was uh, uh, asked to do these uh, uh, decorative uh, patterns in different um, maybe I don't know. Maybe, yes, maybe they are copying each other. Like when you did a beautiful design, somebody copied it. But either or. Somebody would copy it afterwards. It's one of the, it's one it of is, the most beautiful uh, Mamluk designs. And it's it's a complicated one. It's very complicated. Very it's not complicated. easy. It's not simple. I think the one he did. Oh, here is the one which. Yeah, I now I'm taking you to another to a more complex design because, yes, yes. as you know, Islamic architecture is famous with the mukarnas, which is the stalactite that are used mainly in entrance portals, and they are there to adorn the summit of the portal. It's one of the strongest architecture element in the Islamic architecture, not just uh, uh, limited to the Mamluks, but you find it as well in Turkey and, and in Iran and in Syria. But I took you to this one. It's the, 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 the entrance portal of the palace of Amir Kosun, and it's the only surviving palace which is terribly in a, in in a, a, bad state. In a ruinous state. Yeah. The only palace surviving that is with this grandeur. It's a beautiful, big structure. The Mukarnas is not as sophisticated maybe as of Sultan Hassan or Mu'ayyad Sheikh or even Umm Sultan Shaban. If you look at this, you would say this is a simple Mukarnas. But I, I, I was very happy that you decided to work from this one because I think I, it's I a don't very powerful it, design. I don't see it. No, Omne, I don't see it this way. I, I saw that this is the most beautiful Muqarnas in the Mamluk period. Because of it's, its simplicity. It is, no, it is different. You know, this modern, uh, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the focus on these lines, this is completely modern. And this half round, half round flowers, which on the, on the, on the side, you know, when, when I think oh, I remember- These ones. Yes, these ones. And the form, when you see the form, the form of this and the form of these lines and how he combined these flowers with these straight lines, it is, it's, it is a genius. I remember when I look up as if <gasps> I will have a heart attack to see all this. Really, it was amazing. The combination and between the simple pieces 
and 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 uh, and this it is unusual for me and you know this necklace is actually it took it, we made 40 models and 40 um 40 maquettes uh, yes. of the base to, to, to wear it and to be comfortable when you are wearing this uh, because because here this is different. This is a three-dimensional composition that you are transforming into a level that also it was important to have it sit nicely on the chest nicely. when you when you, when, I, I, when the ladies are wear, wearing it. So that it's and it's like a structure in itself. And it has to be light on Nayakam and not not so heavy when you wear it. No, it is one of the the the, the pieces which really I love it. But it's, at uh, the end, it's, and it's actually it's, it's one of the best uh, sellers in the collection as well. Well, I, yeah. I was very impressed because I, I I thought people will not go for it, but actually no, I'm, I'm very Me happy. Too. That. Me too. I said, who's going to wear a mukharnas around his neck? But <laughs> alhamdulillah, it's <laughs> we succeed. But this is just to show you how the, the building, unfortunately, is in terrible neglect. And it has been a dream of mine, maybe for 20 years now, that maybe one day I'll be able to restore it. So who knows, inshallah, it will it will yeah. need a lot of uh, effort and support, but who knows, we'll try. And with this piece, we, we called it the Baybars Kaib Bay. And Baybars is actually the almost the very first Sultan. The Mamluk Sultanate was created uh, because of his, um, uh, of his um, of the system he uh, put in place for for the for the empire, and Kaid Bey. So Babers is a Bahari Mamluk Sultan, and Kaid Bey is a Circassian Sultan. So Kaid Bey is at the late 15th century. In, in in a way, this piece was uniting the beginning and the end of the of the Mamluk Sultanate, and you picked two architecture element, which is the lentil, the stone lentils on top of doors from these two monuments. So this is from Kaid Bay, and then you had as well the other one from uh, Babers, and you created this this bangle with three different designs, which are uh, uh, duplicated because yeah. you have six sides. Look look at the the modern the modern geometric one down. Yani, how they did this? How how it came to to the mind of the crafts the craftsman who who did this? How he put this all together? He's a genius. They are world, uh, genius people. And to draw it, well, this is, it's, again, it's, it's very it's, complex. It's very complicated. This is geometry here. I mean, yeah, and, and yeah. for me, yeah. it's the one best, of the questions I keep on asking it's the best myself. Uh, geometry in the world. This is the best geometry. It, it is. I totally agree with you. And then we have the, the Mamluk necklace, which I'm actually wearing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I love this piece because it is it is telling too many stories in, in just one piece. So we have the rank here, the, the, the blazon. We have this is from a fountain in the Bimaristan of uh, Kalawun. And here is from the Mashrabea of Meridane with the little pieces yes. that looks like the, yes. the kinder yes. from the yes. from the Mimbo. Yes, so it's, that's why we couldn't give it a name, and we we named it the Mamluk necklace because it's uh, it's like telling the story of the Mamluk um, uh, architecture element into one. And actually, I'm I'm very thankful that you gave me uh, the freedom of naming the pieces because what well, this is also the it's the six uh, the eight sided um, uh, eight fold star, and I decided to call it Jashankir from the. Um, the Khanka of Babers al Jashankir in Gamaleya. And I picked Jashankir because it's not a common name. So people will ask, what's a Jashankir? <laughs> and Jashankir it was one of the royal titles. He was the one who tasted the food before the Sultan. So he's the taster. Uh, like you also had the master of the robes, the, the cup uh, bearer. Uh, so, and you had the Salahdar, etc., for, for uh, uh, weapons. Um, so it's, and, and, and I'm happy that. Probably with this collection, we're introducing um, a bit of awareness about this uh, this heritage and uh, and the richness it, it has. And then finally, this is the piece that I, I actually was uh, asked you for when we first met, when I asked, can you make me a piece for the Mamluk members? And then you you came back and made me a collection. But this is the, the Bars Bay earrings, even though the member was made for another mosque, for the mosque of El Ghamri, which was uh, um, demolished in the 19th century. So the committee 
<clears throat> for the conservation of Islamic art, of Arab art at the time they used to call it, they transported this member and put it in the Khanka of uh, Bars Bay, which is in the City of the Dead. And really, if you are in Cairo, you have to go and sit closely to this member and look at its beautiful, beautiful pattern. And when you designed this piece, Aza, it was also, it, 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 it's like creating a dialogue with the member because the member with all the, 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 the pieces being, um, it's like a puzzle, you know, one into the other. And when you did this, this piece as well, the, the silver and the gold, it was also the structure of putting. Yes, and inside at the, at the, at the center, there is stones. A lot of stones in that. The center, there is stone. So you, you inlaid it with precious stones, like they inlaid it with mother of pearl. Yes, yes. Yeah. And you, you know, the other problem is you have to make it light. But part of the earrings, it has to be open work, and the other has to be solid. And you have to, 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 to keep the harmony between the open work and the solid one, and the harmony between the silver and gold, how you distribute the colors of the, of the two metals. And how it moves, because you know, at the top of the end, this is the stud of the earrings, and it has to move on the. It has. I can't make it very stiff. But actually, uh, yeah, you know, usually when you design, you face technical problems, and you face uh, also uh, things which is, has to be light, comfortable, and many, many, many. I mean, uh, many uh, important things that you have to 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 be aware when you are designing jewelry for people to wear and i think you told me for the stud you decided to to you were inspired by the door knockers Bizarre. Bizarre. Yeah. i used the door knocker of sultan hassan to put the, the motifs from the member and to reach yeah. this you have to try many to make many trials sometimes you make it and it's very clumsy no i have to change it and at the end, we, we, we decided to take the simple knocker of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the door and make it as the, uh, the to, to put the stud on the, on the back of it. I mean, what turning, makes the member of Al-Ghamri? Uh, sorry, turning. Excuse me, this is, again? This is, this is architecture monument. To turn it to jewelry, this is what the problem. Exactly. Because this is, the yeah. function was, function wasn't on wood. And to turn it to another metal and be wearable, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, a challenge. And particularly for this member, this member was also a challenge for the people who made it, the carpenters, because as you look at the pieces, they are curvy linear, you know, so that's even, this is one, you know, that's another challenge in the carpentry. It's not just a few pieces that you put together, no, also that you need to create this this uh, curvy linear shape of, of the piece. And uh, so it was challenging in wood and it's also again challenging when you did it with metal. Yes. yes. Um, in a way, the, the, and you, you can also check the rest of the pieces in the Mamluk collection, uh, but uh, in the end we have 12 pieces designed in the collection. And uh, when uh, we were thinking about where can we launch it, it was exactly a year ago, uh, the 30th of November last year when we launched the collection and you decided to do it in a very special place, Laz. So we I went was to trembling, you know. I was really trembling when we chose the 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 the, 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 the Islamic Museum in Cairo. How I am going to compete? I put my jewelry beside their pieces. They are gorgeous. But Alhamdulillah, it was good, and it was. Uh, I people love it. Yeah, it, it was, was a great a great opening for. Uh, for our collection in this great museum. And it, I mean, and it brings yeah. awareness to the people because a lot of people, uh, after that, they were visiting. I was about to say, yeah. Because yeah. many people were visiting actually for the first time and were discovering the Museum of Islamic Art for the first time. And yeah. because, again, when I was younger in the 90s, I would go to your shops and look at the jewelry in their uh, glass box. And for me, it was like a museum experience. Seeing them at the museum, it felt like, uh, uh, yeah, I'm losing my battery. Just a sec. Yeah. So it, it felt like 
you know, these pieces will be museum pieces in, in, a, in a few years. And because you're celebrating the craftsmanship of the time, and this is what pieces at the museum are telling us as well, you, the inno, innovative innovation, the craftsmanship, the um, richness, the design, the perfection in the design and all of that, it, it is very important. And I want to thank the team, uh, you're, the fantastic team of the Aza Fahmi Jewelry, because honestly, it was such a, a, a wonderful experience to work with them all. And I'm very happy that now they're also speaking Mamluk. <laughs> so in, in a way, I felt that I've done something as well, that I've introduced them to these monuments that uh, Probably they were not on their everyday uh, trajectory while they were visiting the historic city. Um, and if you'd like, you can go to YouTube and you will, if you just uh, put the hashtag Mamluk Reimagine, or if you write the Mamluk collection of Azafami, there is a small uh, three minutes video that you can watch that uh, is showing all the pieces that were designed in the collection. Um, I won't show it now here because with Zoom, sometimes it's, uh, the video is not, uh, uh, you can the, the the sound and you know the images are not always uh, synchronized, uh, but please go and check this video and uh, you can always also go to the shops and check the collection and look at them. You know these are like for me these are museum pieces, so at least you can hold them for now. Uh, yeah, do you have anything else to say, Aza? No, I thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity, Lisa, Omnia. Yeah, I have yeah. it was a dream come true for me, you know, jewelry and architecture and you working with you was also something, Yanni, it's an experience in which I've, I've learned so much and I want to thank you for the opportunity of, you know, including me in this team and, uh, and allowing me to work on something that I love so much, which is our Mamluk heritage and jewelry design. So, you know, it's, uh, I think, yeah, it was it's, for me, really, it was a dream come true. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Aza. Thank you. No, thank, thank you. you both so much for this lecture. Um, I just want to, for those of you attending, if you have any questions, uh, you can please enter them in the, the Q&A button, and uh, we will be happy to answer questions. Um, actually, I think I might start with a question first, is from, and, and directed to both of you, but maybe for Aza specifically, is when you were observing these monuments, I would say what was something that jumped out of you or jumped out for you as both a challenge within your design process, but also what was something that surprised you uh, that you had to include within your collection? First of all, I have to, when I look to a, a monument like that, sometimes, because I can't focus on the whole monument, but I have to focus on a, a square or a piece of things which I can see it, I can turn it to a jewelry. Uh, maybe a knocker, uh, maybe a motif on a door, uh, maybe a window which have a, a a repetitive motifs of, uh, of cast iron. Immediately, Louisa, I saw it at jewelry. You know, mm -hmm. uh, since I started my, my, my career, I turn everything beauty in my eyes to jewelry. You know, when I see a flower, I saw the form of the flower and I see it immediately. How can I do it to jewelry? Mm -hmm. When I saw a motif on, on, a, on a textile, I see it immediately. If I connect this together, it can be a chain. It can be a nice chain. But actually, this is by experience. You can gain this. But actually, I see a, 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 a part of the part of the of the architecture, and I put it in my jewelry. Yeah, no, wonderful. Uh, we have a question from Marilyn. What is the historical connection between the geometric designs of the Mamluks of Egypt and the beautiful geometric designs of Islamic Spain, as in Sevilla, for example? Uh, was the design carried through the Islamic conquest or did the artist in Spain embellish it? The Spanish version seems to have a lot of color, lots of blues and yellows, for example. I don't know. <laughs> 
Yeah, the Andalusian, um, Andalusian pattern. There is a difference, with, a, a slight difference between the geometry. And I know, I think today by experience, when I look at a, a piece that is from North Africa or uh, Andalusia, my eyes are maybe a little bit more trained and I immediately know this is not from Egypt, this is from North Africa. I cannot really tell what is it because you can have 12 fold star and the 16 fold and, and all, but the, the, the um, I think, I don't know, I, it, you have some length, you know, the, the, the shapes of, uh, um, of the, the star patterns are slightly different. The base of the geometry is usually the same. We always start drawing things with the same time. You need a compass and that's all you need to do and to be able to divide your pattern. Um, but uh, I really, I don't have the answer for this question, to be honest. It's just that by practice, I, I can feel where is this coming from by seeing many patterns from a different region. And by the way, we had craftsmen from North Africa uh, coming to work in Mamluk Cairo. Look at the, uh, the minaret of Nasser Muhammad in um, uh, also in in in, in Shari al Muayz and uh, the gypsum work that was done. It's interesting because on this one uh, uh, complex, this one and the other one, you have influences from uh, east and west, from Persia to North Africa. But um, it's just the experience from looking at so many monuments perhaps, but I, I cannot tell geometry wise, but they, I have some very good geometer friends, so we can, I can ask them this question and see if they have- um, I feel, um, Omnia, I feel that, that, that the geometry of papers, if we take the geometry of papers, you, it is actually more ultra modern geometry. I didn't found this in North Africa or in Andalusia. They are more of a traditional one even the repetition, but to go extremely modern, I think I found it only in the Mamluk. Well, you know, the Mamluks, they built on what was before, the Ayyubids and the Fatimids. And uh, already there was this tradition of geometry and of, especially in the carpentry and the stone carving that existed in Cairo at the time. So they used the craftsmen, which were already um, uh, trained in this tradition. And I think, when you have an, an exciting uh, client in a way, you know, you have the Sultan who wants to do something uh, um, outstanding, Different. something magnificent. And because bear in mind that the Mamluks, they were not like le the legit legitimate um, uh, rulers, let's say in some, uh, in some parts of the Islamic world, they would consider them then, you know, why are you now the, the Sultans of Egypt? They have to uh, impose their, um, not just impose, they had to justify being the rulers of Egypt. They brought the um, the Khalifa from, uh, from uh, Baghdad and the Khalifa was uh, started taking Cairo as residence because after the Mongols and the fall of Baghdad and the loss of the Abbasids. And it was a way of also acquiring this le legitimacy. So again, the architecture was another medium to promote this image that uh, the rulers of Egypt wanted to um, uh, to show the rest of uh, the Islamic and Arab uh, world. So I am sure that they only hire the best. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have uh, not a question, but a comment. Uh, the gorgeous motif used in the Kowloon cuff has some passing similarities to the pharaonic motif of the Hecker frieze. Uh -huh. So we want I've... to see that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Which one? The the Kowloon cuff. I th I, I can see where you they're see thinking. The that. Kowloon cuff. They have yeah. similarity. The similarity. Please send us an image sometime to to check it. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe the first. I had a discussion. Before. Maybe the impression of the borders, because in temples, when you look up, you you, you see the borders, the borders which is they have uh, either uh, triangles of uh, or uh, rectangulars. Maybe this is a similarity comb, but it's completely, I think, uh, uh, not similar. <laughs> uh, I'll be so excited if there is ancient Egyptian uh, inspiration in this piece. That would show that, you know, that the medieval uh, builders, they went and checked these temples and uh, 
got inspiration well, from the work of the ancestors. As an Egyptologist, <laughs> I will say everything goes back to ancient Egypt, of exactly. course. Exactly. <laughs> but we will investigate this, Louise, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, Louise, I think we have to, I have to, you, you, you give me an idea now. I think I have to make something with a combination of Coptic, Islamic, and Veronic. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, crazy, a crazy piece. <laughs> um, uh, we have a, a question, which uh, I think I can answer from Anne. Are your pieces available online? I think the answer is yes to that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, check the uh, website. The... Yeah, I think it's, it's as a fuckme.com, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, question from Miriam. Um, how could I start jewelry design by self-learning? Uh, where to start such a career? She says she loves you so much and you're such an inspiration. <laughs> She's in Cairo? I, I guess so. She doesn't say. So Miriam, if you're uh, online and you want to shoot us your, you can shoot uh, to myself. You can as a family design studio. There yes, because I have a school. Uh, another question. Um, the ancient Egyptians were inspired by the nature around them. Would you consider a jewelry line inspired by Egypt's plants and wildlife? I think I did that in the Pharaonic collection. Uh, we did, we took from the Amarna period uh, a bracelet from the plants of the Amarna. I love this period very much because it's, a, it's very modern, uh, this period. But I think I have in my collection, I have a, I have a, 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 um, a bracelet from the plants of the, uh, of the Amarna. Mm. Uh, oh, a question on the opening picture. Uh, I have sent it looks like a mosque, but where? <laughs> I'm going to actually put it again because it, feel, it felt like a, a tiny puzzle. Uh, it, it, the mosque is in Sayyida Zaina. And uh, uh, if you go in, it's, it, the street is called Abdel Mijid al Aban, and it is the Salar and Sangar al Gawli. I don't know why my, yeah, my presentation froze. Here we go. Unfortunately, and unfortunately, the, the mausoleum is closed, but I hope that uh, one day it will again be open uh, to the public. And when I took this photograph, I was literally inside the mihrab. So I was standing in the mihrab niche. And because you see this curvature here, this is the mihrab's curvature. And this is the, 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 um, the roofing of it. It has a word for it, but I can't remember it now. And then you see, this is the dome of Salar and the, the Amir is buried under uh, the, next to it. But I was inside the mihrab when I took it. It just, it felt so many details in just one shot. And you feel it's a collage, but it's not. <laughs> it's just uh, the mihrab of, the, of, the, of Salar's uh, mausoleum. And Salar and Sangar, they, it's, it's a very, um, it's an interesting story because he, he, he died in the prisons of Nasser Muhammad out of, and he died of hunger actually, because the, he was very arrogant and the, the Sultan decided to leave it to die without giving him any food. And there's also the sad story that he was found, you know, he, he ate his own shoe. But uh, anyways, this is the, the cruelty of the medieval history sometimes. You don't know if it's the, the reality because we have these, uh, in, these, uh, uh, news from the historians of the time, and you don't know how uh, trustworthy they could be sometimes. So, 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 uh, uh, so the Emir built this mausoleum for his friend, and his own mausoleum is very modest and with absolutely no decoration. He decorated the mihrab of his friend. Yeah, uh, it's a great picture. Um, I hope it will be open again because it's it's really a wonderful monument and it's just uh, it was open for prayers uh, not that far away but uh, recently they just closed it because of I think there must be some structural problems and uh, 
well, that's another beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, monument in the historic city that uh, needs attention and care. So, you know, by, by, by telling these stories through the pieces, through the jewelry, this is how you also create awareness so that uh, the uh, people would be, um, would consider that maybe, I hope in the future, the private sector will be um, investing more in Egypt's heritage because you cannot leave it all to the state. It's a lot of work. And you know, heritage is usually doesn't bring that much money either. So it's very important that we, the citizens of the city also take care of our own monuments and invest in, 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 in their uh, well keep and maintenance and uh, restoration. So hopefully this could uh, lead up to other uh, projects in the future where we can rescue these monuments. There's no shortage of monuments that need <laughs> doing, and there's all so important. <laughs> um, have a question for, well, first a comment saying, I love your jewelry. Um, and then could you picture uh, the daily scene of your workshop? Who are the artisans who make your ideas come true? Um, are they all Egyptians? And are your pieces handmade only? Uh, you know, I have a team of 26 people working in my department uh, between um, people, uh, um, you know, after I did the, the sketches and finished the sketches, uh, we start uh, putting some of the, some of the things we, we start putting in computers and I, I have a technician which is, can turn this to because when you draw something and you turn it to a metal, uh, you have uh, to, to be aware of the thickness of the, of the metal and, uh, and, uh, and many technical problems. But I have, a I have a team of technical, they are all engineers. And I have uh, um, you know, people working on computers and I have people working on forming sculptures and I have calligraphers uh, and I have people in the administration that took notes to be sure that's everything I said uh, when I'm, I'm, I'm telling them, them it, it, it will be, it will be corrected. It's, it's really a, a, a big team, a big team. And after that, we, we, we start working, I start working with the team and then finish the prototype. And then when I finish the prototype, I give it to the market and I have no clue so ever, but what's happened after that. They have to decide how many pieces, if I, we are going to produce uh, uh, 10 pieces or 20 pieces. And, and there is a people who do the, the bill of material because when you go from, from the design department to the production department, it has to be on, a, uh, the, the bill of material has to be accompanied by the uh, prototype, how many grams of uh, uh, gold, how many grams of silver, how many effort we did to calculate the price of the things. It's a, it's a long, long, uh, I mean, uh, process and process. Uh, a bit complicated. I mean, Louise, just to tell you for the Mamluk collection, it took us two years. Yeah, yeah, for 12 pieces, isn't it, Mishkeda? Yeah. It was. 12 pieces. Ah, yes. Years pieces and it was non-stop non -stop working. <laughs> uh, question from Farah. Uh, do you think the Mamluks used uh, just compass and straight edge for constructing patterns? So maybe how, how do you think they went about constructing these patterns? What do you think, Omni? We don't have we don't have records, unfortunately, but being someone who worked on the field, let's say, you, camp, the compass is your tool, you know? You, you, you need a thread, and even with a thread, you can do your, uh, your length uh, on, the, on the ground, even uh, if you want to do it uh, on, on site. Um, but I know that they use compasses because we have some records for, uh, um, for mathematicians, at least, you know? You, you, they've, they've, uh, they've studied uh, this geometry thoroughly. Um, you don't have the other tools that uh, we are using today, they didn't exist. The compass was always the, the base. Uh, the fact of, you know, there's a big debate in 
the artist with, between art historians and, and historians uh, of, of this period of did the Mamluk um, this, uh, draw their monuments or not? That was actually part of my PhD <laughs> because being an architect, I cannot at all imagine that you can build these monuments to this perfection, to the millimeter without calculating beforehand and drawing things beforehand. But you know, also with architects, once you have the, the end result is the monument and it's there, you don't need, you don't have a documentation process at the time, huh? So, or, or an archiving system. So we just, you could throw away your papers because well, the example is in front of us. If we need to copy it, we will just take the dimensions. And actually we have some records like this, like uh, Al Mu'ayyid Sheikh would ask uh, to have domes similar to the domes that Farag ibn Mar'u had built with the zigzags uh, domes. And uh, you, you, we know that uh, they used to do wooden uh, maquettes uh, to, to show the, the complexes. And um, you know, th there are different interpretations. Sometimes it doesn't have to be just paper, but uh, they can just so we're interested about this example. How about you build me something similar to this? So, because nothing has survived in written saying, how did they build these monuments? But um, as, as, as someone who, who draws and who actually work in, in architecture, I, some, I, I try to imagine how, how things could have been. And I'm sure that um, there was a process in which they had to think through because, you know, and, and as I can say this as well, uh, you have different patterns in the same space. If these patterns, if you don't create the, 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 the harmony and the balance between them, it will be messy, <laughs> you know? Of course, so, you know, yes, design is a, design is balance and harmony. If you, if you do design design is balance, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you have to think it through and you have to try one time, two times, 20 times until you reach, and that's a question for Azza, when do you reach a phase and then you say, yeah, this is the final one. I am satisfied, this is what we are going to do because we do many variations throughout the process. And at one point you look at something and you say, this is it. I'm going with this one, you know, like with the Mukarnas necklace, you decided this is the design I want to work on at the end, yes, but it came you know, after 40 trials. Actually, actually, Amnaya, you train your, your eyes uh, by by years and years, I'm I'm 50 years in this uh, in this profession. But actually, my my eyes is very trained to see the unbalanced lines between in the in the in the design. But actually, I see it immediately. Immediately, I I can recognize where is the the wrong line, in in the in the in the in this small paper. This is I think it came by training. And it's it's. I always say it's always the, the link between the eye and the hand. That's why you cannot yes. just always yes. look or always draw. You have to have these two, uh, yes. two together because this is when you can uh, perfection it and you can really master. And I think it. you have you have to connect it to the heart. Otherwise, if you didn't like the piece, you will not give the people the same feeling. Your heart has to love it. <laughs> Very important. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Someone said I, something very nice the other day, and I think it was heart, head. There was something, a third thing, but I can't remember what it was. You know, that you design with. You know that the, 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 the head. You 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 have you know, you heart you have a heart in your body and you have a heart in your hand. If, you, if your hand doesn't love what you are doing, you will not transfer this feeling to, to the piece. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody just commented heart, head, and hand. Hand, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> you will not, you know, sometimes when you look to a nice piece, the, the piece talk to you, actually, you feel something happen to you when you see a nice piece. Uh, for me, it is, I feel that this piece is talking to me. <laughs> so I, we have, I think, two very appropriate final questions. 
Um, from Dina, she's asking uh, for Aza, what is your next inspiration coming from? <laughs> I can't say, Louisa, I can't say, this is, they are going to kill me. If <laughs> I mentioned my next collection, they're going to kill me and, and the company. <laughs> okay, that's totally fair. A very nice subject. Um, and uh, I guess the final question is, um, uh, from Dina, who says, brand Egypt globally is not oftentimes associated with quality design and excellence, but Aza is the only global brand really from Egypt. So how do you see the future in this space? Is there a place for Egypt on the global design scene? Uh, uh, I think that in the last five years, I saw a lot of young designers. They have great opportunities if they are serious to develop their work and working hard to develop this, I think they can reach this. But there is a movement now, you, you see it in Cairo, yeah? there is a movement in many things, not, not only in jewelry, in many things. Uh, they're doing furniture, they're doing uh, sometimes clothes and uh, shoes, uh, uh, textile, no, I am, I'm very optimistic about, about the young designers in, uh, in, uh, in, in Egypt, but they need more and more and more and more, more experience and more uh, work. Well, I'm, I personally am very excited to see not only your work, but I, a lot of, there's some very wonderful young designers up in Congo. Yes, yes. so I, I love to see the inspiration in all these different uh, design spheres within Egypt. I think it's just really wonderful to to see, and I, I hope it does gain more notoriety, just as your your amazing <laughs> work has. Um, so I I just want to close with again thanking both uh, Azam and Omnea for their wonderful lecture today, and thank all of you for for joining us. Um, and if you're interested in uh, RC's efforts to research and conserve Egypt's past, I urge you to visit rc.org and make a contribution today or sign up to become a member as we rely on your support to make all of our work possible. So thank you again. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you all at our next member only lecture on December 6th. And thank you yet again, um, Aza and Omnea. And oh, I hope everybody- Thank you, Louise. <laughs> No, thank, thank you. And I hope everybody now has a happy holidays. So take care. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.